the desire that makes use of that education in working for the betterment of humankind. It does not demand geniuses to make a difference. It takes dreamers. Dreamers who can look at some information or idea and stay away to utilize that information in a manner that no one has utilized it before. The developers of Google did not invent information or technology. They figured out how to make it available to millions of people. Each step in our learning opens up the opportunity to go on to further learning and to greater knowledge. Technology will continue to do great things, but we need to recognize that we know more about heart and liver transplants than we do about how to get people to like themselves and others. We know more about how to physically transmit a message than we do about how to talk to each other. We know more about how to test people than we do about how to teach people. We know more about how to treat a child with burns than we do what to do with a burned out child. We know more about how to try to solve the world's problems with threats and bombs and war than we do how to deal with world problems through respect and discussion and talk. We continue to struggle with what I call the terrible questions of life. Cain asked one, am I my brother's keeper? Christ asked another one. Who, er, another per, a person asked Christ another one. Who is my neighbor? Hamlet asked one, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler for the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. In Shakespeare's play, Henry IV, part one, Falstaff asks as he contemplates going into battle, what is honor? What hath it? Who hath it? Mankind is still struggling to answer those questions and make sense of our humanity while we live in times of great technological upheaval. Do not forget that at the most basic level of our existence, we walk through life, not pleading for technology, but screaming, for God's sake, care about me, listen to me, love me. Today's Detroit Free Press notes a new round of research by Nielsen, which shows member communities such as Twitter and Facebook have overtaken personal emails, the fourth most popular way people spend time online after search, portals, and software applications. It is clear that we are searching for human connections and for the opportunity to share our lives with others. The university is also the place we go to consider our history and our humanity. I've had my life changed because of great writers who allowed me to feel and see and hear and have great insight, even though I didn't directly have the experience myself. Great historians let us see and hear the experience and feelings of times gone by. Great literature and art allows us to see the world in ways we have not seen it before. As an undergraduate, I had to read John Steinbeck's great novel, Grapes of Wrath. It changed my life. I traveled with the Jobs. I was brutalized by the Union Busters. I ached when Rosa Sharn lost her baby. I exulted when she saved a starving man with the milk of her breast. I learned from Hemingway in his story, The Short Happy Life of Francis McCumber, what happens when man changes. A coward becomes courageous and the people around him have to adjust their own perceptions of themselves. Also with Hemingway, I became a part of the story, The Old Man and the Sea. I thought a lot about the meaning and purpose of learning in life as I read from Jack London's novel, Martin Eden. I also agonized over the unfairness of a culture that would do what it did to a man like Figger Phelps, a character created by Richard Wright in his great novel, Native Son. Shakespeare reminded me that the quality of mercy is not strained. It falleth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. 
It is Christ for us, the flesh of him that gives and him that receives. His mightiest and the mightiest. It becomes the throne monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth set the fear and dread of kings. But mercy is above the scepter's sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth show us just like God's when mercy seasons justice. And from letters written by St. Paul to the people of Corinth, I learn that even if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the ability to predict the future, and I understand all mysteries, and I have all knowledge, and I have faith to, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all that I have and sacrifice myself for some great cause, but don't do it in love, I gain nothing. Additionally, I have seen the world through the eyes of Vincent van Gogh, Norman Rockwell, Grandma Moses, Picasso, Andy Warhol, and so many others. I found that the more I learned about art, the more I could appreciate the unique ways in which so many people saw the world. I have been at live plays and sat in movie theaters and watched people playing a part. Yet sitting there, I have sometimes cried from the depths of my being, or I have laughed until tears came and my stomach hurt, or been so frightened that I had to close my eyes to escape the terror. Well over half the truly life-changing, significant experiences of my life have come through literature and the arts. Another dimension of the university that I hold in great regard is the determination and the courage that has so often resulted in major changes in government and culture. I've been lucky to travel with my children, with Katie, to many parts of the world. If there are places in a city or country we, where we are visiting, and that it is a place where university of students put their lives in danger to bring down repressive governments or have taken action to enhance human dignity, or there are places where the stand against oppression or unfairness took place, I find myself drawn to those spots. I've stood on the spot in Hungary where students fought to get rid of a repressive communist regime, where students attacked tanks with no armor of their own to protect them. In Prague, I went to see the spot where a student set himself on fire and began a revolution that freed both the Czech Republic as well as Slovakia. I stood in Bucharest, where the revolution that brought down Nikolai Ceausescu Ceausescu, Ceausescu, and I touched the pockmarks on buildings, pockmarks made by the bullets fired at university students who had been ringleaders of the demonstration. I walked across Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China, and tried to imagine the courage it took for young university students to stand up to the military might of a great world power. Even in the United States, I have seen the courage and commitment of university students. On February 1st, 1960, just 49 years ago, four African-American students sat down at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and politely asked for service. Their request was refused. When asked to leave, they remained in their seats. At that point, a crowd of white people pulled them off their stools and began to mercilessly beat them. Those students' peaceful resistance and peaceful sit-down helped ignite a youth-led movement to challenge racial inequalities throughout the South. Their commitment led to the desegregation of the F.W. Woolworth lunch counter on July 25, 1960. At Eastern Michigan University, on February